Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Exploring Cinema. I'm Nate. And I'm Dylan. And I'm Adam. And today we are wrapping up February, or excuse me, it is February. <laughs> We're wrapping up January slightly later than we wanted to. Mm-hmm. But the last movie of our month uh, with movies focusing on child performances, we watched Searching for Bobby Fischer from 1993, mm-hmm. directed by Steve Zalian. This is one of my favorite movies of all time. Dylan had seen it before. Adam had never seen it. So I was really excited to see how he was going to react. Anything you guys want to share before we dive into it? Or should I just get to the at a glance stuff? Um, I just want to say, obviously, you'd hype this up a ton. Uh, So going in, sometimes that can ruin a movie uh, or at least set the wrong expectations. Uh, And I thought uh it lived up to it so that was that was pretty solid uh, wonderful pretty exci- yeah pretty excited about that <laughs> um and then if we want uh, i can just roll right into what it's about yeah please sure. do searching for bobby fisher from 1993 a prepubescent chess prodigy is encouraged to harden himself in order to become a champion like the famous but unlikable bobby fisher oh, so at a yeah glance. Uh, this movie, I think, got a little bit more run um, after Queen's Gambit came out and kind of mm. sparked everybody's interest in, like, are there other movies or shows like this out there? And, yeah. and this came up a little bit, I'm sure. But uh, this is a movie I feel like we're going to have a lot to say about. So I'm just going to dive right into At a Glance, again, Searching for Robbie Fisher, 1993, directed by Steve Zalian and written by him as well, um, adapted from a book written by... Fred Waitzkin about his son and about his experience with kind of the entire youth chess world, not just the youth chess world, but specifically that as that's what his kid was participating Mm in, Mm -hmm. uh, had a budget of $12 million and Dylan, here you go. You want to guess how much money it made? Uh, I'm I'm guessing it it made a little bit of money. 25 mil. No, $7.2 million. It lost money. Yep. Wow. Oh, wow. I got to move it up in my rankings now. It might have just earned another <laughs> half a star. Just more respect. Mm-hmm. Way more respect. Only 7.2 in 1993 when everybody was trying to spend money and go to the movie. Yeah, I, I think <laughs> it's got a lot to do with the title, which doesn't tell you at all what this movie is really about. And I think is just kind of the weak point. It works really well once you've seen the movie. Mm-hmm. But if you hear Absolutely. that, you're not going to be like, oh, I bet it's about this like seven-year-old kid who's really good at chess. <laughs> not where it's going to take oh, yeah. you. Everyone, everyone thinks it's about Bobby Fischer, either a documentary or like a dramatized movie about him. Right. Yeah. Bad title. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so accolades, 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. They Bam. get it over there. Yeah. They 7. Get 4 on IMDb and only a 3.5 on Letterboxd. The Letterboxd community does not let me down very often. <laughs> but in this case, I feel like as a group, far too low mm-hmm. on this movie. It got one Oscar nomination, which was for Best Cinematography. It lost Best Cinematography to Schindler's List, which Steve Zalian also wrote. Oh, wow. So yeah. he had quite what a year for him. Year. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, four stars from Roger Ebert. Number 96 on AFI's list from 2006 for the most inspiring movies ever made. Oh. It is in Mike Flanagan's top 100 movies of all time. One of our favorite directors around here. Mm -hmm. And it is my number 18 movie of all time. And that feels low. 18? It actually does for like how much you've talked about it. Yeah. At least least you mentioned it. it, I feel like this should be higher, but I don't know. But also anyone who has has, uh, listened to this podcast, whenever your rankings come up, I mean, it's tough to get to the top. I mean, we, we talked for a long time about Paper Moon and how much we all loved it. And you don't have it that high. You know, it was no, somewhere like in like the one teens or something. It was like the one teen. So it was a, an hour of love for that movie. And then, yeah, it made, it was like, it made 113 on my list. Wow. <laughs> 18. I mean, I think that actually is very high praise. That's fair. Yeah. That's really getting into like God tier for me. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, all right. And then before we get into it, like, and subscribe to help the channel grow. Make sure you get notified. We do about one of these deep dive reviews per week and starting in the month of february we're going to be adding a little bit kind of at the beginning and ending of each month to provide mm-hmm. just a little more context and maybe some sort of smaller bite bite-sized stuff for people to check out yep uh with that said 
getting into February. We'll have an episode actually talking about kind of what the theme for the month is, but it shouldn't be too surprising that the first, if you know the theme, that the first movie we're going to be talking about in February is going to be uh, Wong Kar Wai's masterpiece, In the Mood for Love, from the year mm-hmm. 2000. Uh, yes. I got the 4K Criterion version of that, and I am very excited to watch that movie again with you guys who have not seen it. So that's yes. gonna be, that should be a really good time. Mm-hmm. On to opening statements. And Adam, you're the the person who just watched this for the first time, so yeah, I'm just curious guy. to know what you thought. Yeah, uh, so I, I wrote something for this one. I just have uh, something very simple. Uh, a movie much more about competitors than competition and the never-ending lesson that winning isn't everything. Yes, Ooh. love it. Nice. Next. My opening, <laughs> no, that's great. I, yeah. My opening statement is also uh, succinct and short. Mine is just uh, being a kid in the 90s really was the best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's yeah. just this movie is just it's so like I feel like it's it, there, there's such a time capsule quality to it. I really picked up on that this time rewatching it. Um, and we'll get into more more of that later. But yeah, that'd be my opening statement. Yeah, I'm not 100 percent sure if the movie takes place in the 90s or the late 80s. Mm, I suppose. But but either way, um, yeah. it looks fantastic and just everywhere they go just looks so homey. Yeah, and like the, the the fashion, his like shoes, his like oh, big yeah. mm-hmm. shoes and clothes, all the kids' That's clothes, sweatshirt. the adults' clothes, Ben Kingsley and his big overcoat, and like the the dusty Fishburne Metropolitan and, Club, yeah, you know, Fishburne, like, and even like his like jewelry. He's got like one gold chain on his wrist, to, like, yeah, <laughs> and, and then like like four necklaces. But like it's just it it all works. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, um, but yeah, that's my opening statement. My opening statement is that this is the best sports movie ever made. Oh, I think yeah, I think I have heard that red hot take. Yeah, uh, I I'm, figuring I'm just gonna dive right into it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, keep firing. I don't need to. Keep I don't need keep to kind of life. sneak that little nugget into like halfway through the episode or anything like <laughs> yeah. that. But I mean, kind of to Adam's point, just sort of what it's about. Um, my dad and I have watched this movie like a million times, and there are a lot of movies. I mean, they're not really like this movie specifically but you know you have those movies that you kind of grew up with watching with your parents that weren't Mm -hmm. like quote-unquote kids movies Mm -hmm. even though this is about a kid and kids can absolutely get a ton out of this movie like adults can also get a ton out of this movie Mm -hmm. yeah and so like this and october sky and Mm -hmm. there were a few other like 90s 80s movies stand by me Mm -hmm. um this one some of those movies when i revisit them as an adult they've gone down slightly for me not because i thought they got worse (laughs) so to speak, but because I've just seen so many more movies now that some of them I think like, oh, there are other movies like this. It's a really, really good version of this kind of movie, but there are like a dozen of them that I consider kind of the same. Yeah, yeah. This movie, every time I watch it, it just cements itself more and more as an absolute masterpiece. There's nothing Mm -hmm. else I've ever seen quite like this movie, and I just love it more and more every single time I watch it. Yeah, I think with its its themes, it's 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 balance, I guess we'll call it, and what mm-hmm. it, it's about its sport, but it's about so much more than that. Mm-hmm. Uh, it really, it really does that well without making it like corny or cheesy or trying to like sell it to you. It just is the way that it is, and like that's what you should be, and it tells you that that's what the kind of person or the kind of like competitor, I guess we'll, we'll say, is like that mm-hmm. you should be. Like you should always strive to be like like Josh because he's he's got a good heart. He's fair. Even though he doesn't, he's not supposed to be. He doesn't need to be. Yeah, know? and and that's why, like at the end of the movie, the stakes are just so much higher than whether or not he can be the U.S. champion for his age bracket, right? Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. in that scene, which we'll talk about when we get to defining moments in a bit here, when he says like I have to win, mm-hmm. when his dad tells him that he doesn't, he has to do it his way, and yes. it just adds so much more weight to the end of that where a lot of sports movies, you just want them to win because you like the characters and they've worked really hard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is totally fine. That's what a lot of sports movies are supposed to be, but there's just an added element to this that I, that for me rises it above all others. For me, uh, it's what I appreciate every time is how, like you said, it's in your opinion, the greatest sports movie ever made. It is a sports movie, but you, you wouldn't think that chess would work well as a sports movie. And I guarantee, you know, if 
movies about chess were pitched in the 70s or 80s it was a lot of oh that'll be fun we just watch people sit there and think like ooh, <laughs> yeah. exciting but they find a way with the slapping of the timer and the moving of the pieces and the way they film the chess whenever it's being played to make it you feel it, it you see that it is a sport it's the you the, feel the energy the, you feel the energy the constant back and forth the slapping and the moving and the slapping and the noise it's it represents what's going on in their head mm -hmm. it represents the strategy and the decision making and it's just it was just the way that they shoot the chess is just brilliant yeah <laughs> yeah i like that they it's didn't try really. to show us like a super top down like he's gonna move here so this can happen it's just like because then you just get exactly. bogged down in garbage and this is just so much more like snappy and like you said that's what's going on in their head now you can you can uh make it an auditory response that the audience can hear yeah they don't they don't get bogged down in the minutia of chess moves really you they mm -hmm. talk about it a little bit you see kind of some move but it's not they're not like, yeah, they're not like we're going to dig deep into this and explain what the Schleeman attack or the Fleischman attack is. Or yeah. The Schleeman attack. <laughs> yeah. We're just going to have the guy say, oh, you're cut. What is this? It's the Schleeman attack. Where'd you learn that? Oh, my teacher. Well, forget it. It's garbage. Like that is more effective. We don't need to know what the attack is. That yes, interaction. Totally like, agree. Like, <laughs> so, um, yeah. All right. With that said, I think good time to move on to defining moments. Mm. I basically wrote down the whole movie. So <laughs> yeah. I'm going to just. I have quite I'll, a few. I'm just going to power through these. And then if power I missed room. anything, you guys go ahead and add once we get to the end. For this away. time, I really appreciated this. Um, right at the beginning when they don't stop playing chess when it's raining, the guys in the park, mm. like Josh sees for the first time. Yeah, I yeah. thought that was just a really cool juxtaposition of like kind of the passion that goes into that with like at the party. They're like, all right, pack up, get inside. Mm -hmm. And here we've got these people that it's just like such a way of life. Like rain is not going to stop it. Yeah. And then uh, the second one I have is the entire sequence when Josh plays his dad. Yeah, yep. Mm -hmm. The whole thing is phenomenal, and how he has to show his dad with his eyes that his dad beat him the first mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which I just find so I don't know, like adorable is the right word, but like it's just <laughs> it's so amusing because he just kind of gives him like the mm -hmm. he's like, oh, I won. Yeah, <laughs> and then. Yeah, the way that they um the way that they play it with like him in the bathtub or on the phone, and he's like doing other things. I Best part of that scene though for me is when he uh he takes the phone books off the chair. Yes, <laughs> yeah, smacks oh. them on the floor and then it's sits down fine. and like game on. Like you <laughs> really want to play? Yeah, let's do mm -hmm. it. <laughs> it's so like over the top from a seven year old. You're like, ah, oh, that's great. I love the part when he's in the bathtub. Yeah. He's like, Yeah, you did. Like it's just mm -hmm. like I have you. It is it's great though too because when he's on the phone books it's like this isn't the real me i'm just being a nice kid and then it's like okay when it's ready to play lose the phone books like i play with the table right here like this is how, <laughs> I, this is how I work <laughs> like <laughs> which is it's just a cool visual thing that the movie does that kind of gives him some personality when he's playing mm -hmm. yeah. which i think mm -hmm. just really helps it and then i have when he plays tony schlub at the club Ooh. and then he gives him gummy bears after he beats him because he feels bad yep mm -hmm. which is great and that's the only time uh, we see Tony Shalhoub. Yeah, yep. he's just never the only time. Hey, we got a role for you. <laughs> yeah. Hell yeah. And then um, that's a shout out. What's up? Yeah. The chess tournament that Bruce brings his dad to, mm, like mm -hmm. the first taste and glimpse of what the chess world is like. And then mm -hmm. again, just another random cameo with Andrew Pendleton playing like a nut job, obsessive chess player who makes like five thousand dollars a year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah okay. And then the whole sequence with locking the parents in the basement. Mm -hmm. That's when we meet uh, William Macy, who's a big yeah. fan of tuna fish sandwiches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then um, the conversation that Josh has with his dad, where he says, maybe it's better to not be the best because then you can lose and it's okay. A yeah. really nice reminder that this kid is seven years old. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then the scene in the rain with his dad, where he says, why are you standing so far away from me? Which yeah. is just, God, that, that line just cuts right through you doesn't it yeah, yeah it and, and it's just slipped in there and it's yeah. just like you know exactly what he means when you say it which and it's you're like oh that was a visceral like yeah and, it, and it's the bluntness that kids can speak with where like they're not trying to like kind of weave their way through saying what they mean yeah they're yeah. just gonna tell you yeah then uh it. let's see yeah the scene with bruce where he says you have to hold your opponents in contempt mm -hmm. which like this kid um Max Pomerank just holds his own with everybody, but those scenes with Ben Kingsley, especially, he's just so good. 
and then the parent fight with the mom and the dad kind of arguing about like how hard is he supposed to push and -hmm. what's the right way for him to approach this. Mm -hmm. And then uh, that has the line uh, in there that we were talking about before um, we started recording when she says like how many professional baseball players are afraid of like, losing their father's love every losing time their father's love every time they go to the plate. plate and he slams the door and says all of them yeah which yeah. is fantastic yeah Unbelievable dialogue. yeah that, that, the whole scene is perfect and the then, then the perfect. energy that i get from when josh goes back to the park and plays with Vinny again yeah yeah mm-hmm. when he's finally having a good time and then the bruce scene where he kind of presents him with the certificate and basically apologizes and said he's proud of him Mm-hmm. And then the final match is one of my favorite endings, like climactic scenes to a movie ever. And yeah. the very final line of the movie makes me laugh every time when he tells his <laughs> friend, you're a much stronger player than I was at your age. Yeah. And the, and the, the offering the draw to his nemesis. Yes. That's part of like the entire final game from when it starts to when it ends, the way mm-hmm. they do all of it, like the character set up with the kids Mm-hmm. The movie does an amazing job of having Lawrence Fishburne and Ben Kingsley there, like explaining what's happening to the parents, mm-hmm. yeah. which allows them to explain what's happening to us without mm-hmm. seeming over the top or dance. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's just all done so, so well. That's what I got. Did I miss I, anything? During that, I also, I noticed this time, I love the way it's shot where, uh, you know, his nemesis is at the head table. And they show him moving through the tournament by just seeing like his seat changes as he gets closer and closer to the front of the room. And yeah. then he's facing him. Just a little touch, a little touch that's just, uh, yeah, mm-hmm. brilliant. Um, yeah, my defining moments actually, I'm taking a little different approach with this one. Similar to you, there were so many great scenes that I found it hard to choose. So instead, I focused on things that happen multiple times through the movie that I just kind of define it for me and that I think are wonderful. Okay. So yeah. one is all of the Bobby Fisher flashbacks. Yeah, uh, yeah. Narration. It's just it's so effective. It's like fascinating, but also it fits the theme so well. And Josh's narration just kind of constantly reminding everyone like this is about me, though. It's about a kid like I'm not him, but like it hit like I don't know. It, I just I just love that. And then um, the way the chess scenes are filmed, I already mentioned that the noise, how you just can feel the pieces and everything, the energy. Um, and then throughout the movie, the facial expressions. Uh, of the main character of Josh. Yeah. I feel like to your point, he carries a lot of these scenes where he's with really experienced actors by kind of a less is more approach. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of a more like he, he's not the type of kid who's always talking and has no filter. He's the opposite. He's kind of a quiet kid who is kind of, he, he measures his words and what he says. And sometimes he just doesn't say anything and he just kind of looks. And I just throw out the, just a brilliant performance and just the way he played that, that was fantastic. Um, and then for me, I, the one part, though, which I guess also is throughout the movie, but especially the first time we meet him, uh, his nemesis. I don't know if that what's that kid's name is. Does he actually have a something Poe? He does. One second. Uh, Jonathan Poe. Jonathan, Jonathan Poe. Po. Um, yeah, man. When we first meet him, it's almost yeah. over the top. It's almost over the top how like evil he is portrayed, but it is effective because it's so different than the rest of the movie. Kind of just makes you kind of notice and like, oh wait, this is different. Like, and then it's also um, yeah. I noticed this time that that's when Bruce turns. Mm. Mm. That's when he goes from being a more responsible, like let's put Josh's well-being kind of ahead of everything else. Like, I don't think they're playing sports in the club, like I'll throwing the ball against the wall after that guy shows up. Like the next scene when they're practicing is when Bruce is like, we're getting down to business now. No, we're playing in the park because yeah. Bruce like has to beat what I, who I think is his old teacher. I think that's insinuated. Yeah. 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 Um, that and, yeah, oh, Gordon Bombay <laughs> Hawks <laughs> coach action going on here. Well, it's interesting, too, because, yeah, like his. Know. His response to seeing his response to seeing mm-hmm. that kid is like, oh, we need to get down to business. And like, this is the level of competition and we're not there yet is his initial response. Whereas by the end of it, he has come around to the idea and kind of the audience of like that kid has a lot bigger issues being raised like that and only caring about chess. And like Josh is a good kid with a good heart and, you know, a normal kid. And that kid like, like the other like, kid can't win. Yeah. 
like yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um but yeah uh, so those are my moments but all the little things all the little touches that happen throughout the movie it's just so wonderful and to your point dude the scenes in the park every time we go there especially later in the movie as everyone else is trying to get so serious and Lawrence Fishburne is like the guy who kind of wants to bring him back to not being so serious like every time we're in the park everything is green and bright and like just beautiful like there's one scene where he meets him there and it, it feels like it's like nine in the morning because Lawrence Fisher's like having like a coffee and reading the newspaper yeah. or whatever, and no one else is there. Just a bright, beautiful day. Like, oh, like I want to go to that. I want to go to that day on that park. Like, it's I love yeah. that scene so much. And one other line that I kind of remembered from one of the scenes that I brought up um, when Bruce talks to him before the big match. Yeah, and Josh tells him that he's scared, which is a really good moment. But then, like, he wraps up that conversation with like, "Will you stay with me until it's over?" Like the way that line is delivered, Josh is so convinced he's going to lose. Yeah. Like yeah. he doesn't like just the way until it's over. Like he's just viewing the whole thing as it's going to be pain mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's it. And then he's able to sit down and kind of get in a rhythm. Mm -hmm. And once he gets to the table, it's kind of like, this is where he, it's where he cooks. Yeah. And he's more let comfortable. Josh than, cook. Let Josh let's cook. That should have oh been the God. title of the movie. A Josh. shirt that says less Josh cook. And it's just it hit Josh from searching for Bobby fish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh man uh, adam were there any other ones that we, I the, like we covered pretty much every scene pretty much the only addendum i will make is again one of those little things you were talking about um it's in the back and forth with uh bruce uh, i think it's over like his the strategy and maybe it's the contempt conversation but maybe it's the certificate conversation i think that when he gets mad at him mm -hmm. um when they use the pieces of the chessboard to go back and forth between the characters like like uh, Bobby is the is the white team, and then uh, Bruce is the black team, and it just it switches from like the rook to the knight to the pawn to the this as to the that as they're back going back and yeah, forth. Yeah, that and was it's so effective and it's so cool. And I was like, oh, that was neat. I just it really fit. And there's mm -hmm. just pieces on a board, like it just it really just sells the whole like aesthetic of it. It was perfect. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, that's that. my only addendum. All right, yeah, just so many. I mean, like I said, it's basically the entire movie. Mm -hmm. no, none of us even mentioned the scene. When Montaigne really goes for it with the with Laura Linney. Yeah, oh with yeah, with, yeah, yeah. Oh uh, well, I'll I'll mention that scene. Yeah, I mean from an acting a perspective, little over the top. Montaigne <laughs> oh, is amazing. He is. All right, questions. I have a few here. Okay. Um, they sort of answer this, but I was thinking about it a little differently from the way that it starts. Why do you think Josh didn't want to play chess with his dad at first? Because he doesn't want to play the second time because, like, he knows what his dad can do and he can beat him. Mm -hmm. Do you think he already knows that? Or is there, like, a different reason? Do, like, I guess this time I watched it and thought maybe it's just something that he knew he wanted to keep to himself. And he knew that, like, once his dad became a part of it, then it was going to turn into this thing. Mm. Or it could just be that he knew he was going to kick his ass the whole time and he just didn't want to do it. I, That's interesting. I think it, I think you could have a point because in the few scenes that uh, before chess really takes over the whole movie, we see, we see that his dad is really uh, trying to get Josh to be into baseball mm -hmm. and he's got him his mitt and he's got him. So it is kind of insinuated that his dad is very passionate, kind of a pushy kind of let's, you know, uh competition fought. So that's, that makes sense that maybe Josh knows that if this, if he knows how good he is at chess, that he will want to make it more than it really is. Also, I think it could just be kind of what his mom uh, points out at the end. That That's what I mean. He, right away, he just knows he will beat him because yeah. he probably thinks, I've never seen my dad play this game. We've never played this game. And I feel like I already understand this game pretty well. Like, I think I'm going to beat him if we play and I don't want to embarrass the old man. You I, know, <laughs> I think it's probably a little bit more towards that because she says, like, he let you win, like, immediately. Uh -huh. Like, his mom can see it a mile away, like. He didn't want to play you because he knew he was going to kick your ass because he like he they walk by it at the park and he sees it. And his dad eventually ends up saying something to, or says, uh, Josh doesn't know how to play chess. And she's like, yeah, he does. Uh, like, he's super yeah. fucking good. Yeah. Like, good yeah. luck. like, you know what I mean? Like she knew she knew the whole time. So mm -hmm. uh, and he was completely, completely unaware. So I think he I think Josh was just trying to spare his dad's feelings. Yeah, I think so, too. But that was just kind of a question that I came up with this time that I looked at it in a slightly yeah. different way than I had before. Yeah. And then um, my only other question is Bruce or Vinny? Damn it. Okay, that was my, so that was, well, here, okay, I guess it's a little different. Well, so my question for the group was just going to be choose your mentor. And my, my question <laughs> ben was. Ben Kingsley or Lawrence Fishburne? Yes. Oh, man. So, so this is a two-part question. 
it, first question is Vinnie or, Vinnie or Bruce, as in if it, just in this movie. My question then is if you were to be, you're a character in any movie and you must achieve something that takes perseverance and hard work, <laughs> you must choose and you can choose which actor will play your mentor. Who would you, who do you want? So two kind of separate questions. Ooh. Ooh, I like except that second easy. one. Except for me, it's easy because I love Vinny in this one and I would choose Lawrence Fishburne because The Matrix is my favorite yeah, movie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Ben Kingsley. It's not close. But what do you guys, what would you guys do? <laughs> well, Dylan, you and I have kind of joked about Ben Kingsley playing these roles before. Yes. Where, like he plays so many roles with this like older seasoned guy who has this attitude of like, I am better than you, but I cannot do what I ask of you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> Which is oh, just it is. like, it's such a Ben Kingsley role. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I mean, the beauty of this movie is that he needs them both, right? Yeah. And, and the, the first time that they're like together in a scene is when like the family and, and Josh have kind of rallied around like, this is how we're going to do this. Mm -hmm. Yes. We've found a balance. They can both come now. Yeah, yeah. Because Josh is doing it his way. Yes. Right. Yes, so now Which everyone... Which is the key to everything, and they're just going to have to figure out how to get along, because this is the way Josh is doing it. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I, I can lead this into one of my <laughs> observations and musings, then, is that okay. when I was a kid, uh, Lawrence Fishburne's character in this movie was the coolest person in the world to me. Yeah, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> yeah. I don't think there was anybody else I ever wanted to meet or hang out with. I yeah. think I got to go with, with Fishburne, but it's really close. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah the cool factor he he's really got it uh, bruce is bruce is knowledgeable and, and is exactly what you're looking for if you're like starting a journey and you really like you're you're you've decided that you want to do this journey if you just like happen across like lawrence fishburne's character or Vinny, like you're just going to get sucked into that world it's just going to be like what you are about how would you not, I think I how josh gets into it is he sees it and he's like that's so exciting i mean seriously if you yeah you, you watch this movie like if you were a kid and yeah, like uh, Vinny is cool, and why wouldn't you want to go play in the park with your chess friends? Like, with yeah, your, like, of course you would want to. Like awesome. an adult, yeah. hang out with the same crew like all the time. They're so, nice to you. Like, yeah, because in this, like Vinny, like Fishburne would be really good at kind of pumping you up and like helping you fix your own skills. But then, like Bruce is like the head scout who like oh, yeah. needs to give you the lowdown on the opponent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like, okay, take all this that you've done now. This is what you need to do to beat this person specifically. Yeah, I think, I think, yeah, uh, Vinny is the player's coach, and yeah. and <laughs> and Fred is the tactician. The Vinny uh, is Ron Gardenhire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, so okay, so are we? So Adam, are you also going Vinny and Lawrence Fishburne? Are we all going the cool? I think it's a, there's a bit of a generational thing here too. Yeah. Oh yeah, well that that leads into my uh, observation of musing, but okay, so we're all going Lawrence. Yeah, I I really want to come up with a good answer for your question, your second question, but I don't think I can do it in another five minutes. So I, I'm going to think who you would it. want to play, who you would want, who wants to, who I get to choose as my mentor for like, any specific thing. It's it's a long list. I'm I gotta like draw. I, part of me wants to be like Daniel Radcliffe and just be like, make it weird, make it awesome. You know what I mean? Oh, like <laughs> just be like. Wah. Uh, but then I want like somebody seasoned, like like a, like a Ian McKellen or something like that. Like, oh, that would be you know what Gandalf. I mean. Like, mm -hmm. uh, how do you how do you not have Gandalf teach you how to do something? Yeah, it's tough. Pretty good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you have any questions, Adam? No, I, I'm I'm square. I don't got anything. Okay. All sweet. right. Well, one, two, or did you have one more? No, I was gonna say observation and musing. Can I can I go first because absolutely. I really okay, this is my. I could have a bunch of them, but I'll just I'll I'll get to it uh, right away here. I feel like watching it this time, this movie is a big time capsule of 1993. It might be set in the eighties, but it, it was released in 93. And the reason I say that is because I feel like it's kind of shows like a difference in like the national kind of like ethos and mindset from like the eighties to the nineties. I feel like this movie shows like that transition. And I feel like a lot of it is illustrated with the difference between Fred and Vinny the way they look at it and also the difference between his dad's approach and his mom's approach. And I just feel like if this movie, if this movie was made in 1986, he would just, it would all be about winning the tournament and beating his nemesis. And he would in the end, and that would be the triumph. And then, you know, now if this movie was it made, be the now, kid. 
Yeah, it'd be the Karate Kid. If this movie was made now, it would probably focus a lot more on like Vinny's character and a lot more on the family stuff. And I feel like um, Ben villain. Kingsley's character would probably be portrayed as being in the wrong, like pretty like more like it'd be like that's not the right approach like from the beginning. And I just feel like this being made in 1993 is such a clear almost like changing of the guard. Like we're not like the eighties was all about competition and the way that his dad looks at it and Fred looks at it, which is like, life is like you are ranked and you need to move up the ranks and you need to use this skill to move up the way he talks to Laura Linney, the teacher about how like he's better at anything that I'll ever be or you ever be. So like, as soon as you wrap your head around that, like then we can get on the level. Like this almost like he is skyrocketing and we're going to like, we're all, we're all going to ride these coattails to the top, you know? And that's, that was kind of like what the eighties was about. And then, you know, the, the more approach, the, the Vinny approach, the mom's approach is just like, it's more important that he likes it and that he's a good person. And like, you know, that's kind of like, we care more about that now than like necessarily like winning the competition. And, 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 and I mean, maybe I'm picking up on it too much, but I kind of kept feeling that where I just felt like, and especially just the year it was made. Also, I've been reading Chuck Klosterman's book, the nineties, which talks about how decades it's not like once the 90s start everything is not it takes right. a few years so like the so the bleeding in and this was right around the time that corporations were starting to like and studios were starting to kind of get on board with like okay this is where it's going and how can we make money off that and and whatnot so i picked up on a lot of that i really like that observation i guess we can backtrack slightly then and i'll follow yeah. up question how do you think josh feels about participation trophies i don't think he minds them I, I feel I feel like his friend, like at the end when he tells mm -hmm. his friend, like you're much better than I. I feel like his friend would come back from a tournament with a fifth place trophy, and Josh would be like, "That's cool, man." Yeah, and then they'd move on. It wouldn't be mm -hmm. this yeah. pity thing. Yeah. <laughs> Even if he got like just a participation trophy, he'd be like, "Yeah, well, did you have fun?" Or like, you know, he'd be he'd be a friend to his friend. He wouldn't tell him like, "Oh, that's stupid" or whatever. He'd be like, "Good for you, man. I'm I'm glad you did it." Mm -hmm. And the big and let just to wrap up my point, the big uh, ending of the arc with the dad, when the dad tells him that he doesn't need to play and basically is just completely gives it up and is like, I was wrong. If you want to do it, then let's do it. But if not, that's fine. And I feel like that's kind of the one of the like nails in the hammer of like, this is how we think now about this stuff. Yeah. yeah. Not like that anymore. <laughs> yeah, I really yeah. like that. That's probably one. Of, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I like this movie so much. Mm -hmm. So then I've got a few. Okay. Um, I already said the one about Lawrence Fishburne being the coolest guy in the world in this movie. Um, Josh's bedroom is amazing. As a kid's yep. bedroom, it's absolutely fantastic. I mm -hmm. loved when he watched people play chess and he didn't have a chess board or if they had one, he wasn't aware of it. And he sets up his toys yes. as like chess pieces. I actually did that as a kid. Really? Yeah. I mean, I yeah, maybe I did. Well, too. It has like a medieval like knight yep. fighting style to it, so it wasn't mm -hmm. like straight up like pawns and king. But I, I'd set yeah. them up in that way and kind of I viewed chess like as kind of an adventure like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, the cast is amazing. There are so mm -hmm. many just like uh, phenomenal actors who are in one or two scenes. <laughs> um, you already mentioned this, Dylan. Uh, the sound of the speed chess is fantastic, fantastic, and mm -hmm. makes it like you can see why it's so addicting. Mm -hmm. And then I really like that the villain adult is British. I think that just <laughs> gives it like a little element that kind of makes me chuckle. Just a little snooty, a <laughs> little, little. Yeah. Good. And then uh, my last observation is I really enjoy. Obviously, I never noticed this or picked this up as a kid, but as an adult, you can kind of pick up that the two coat like the the parents use the two coaches Vinny and Bruce as like their own proxy war over Josh and yeah. kind of the mentality around how you should approach being this good at something. Mm -hmm. It was like, you kind of always see like the mom is the one who like brought him to the park for the first time. And like Vinny is her champion. Yeah. And the dad went out and found Bruce and he's paying him and Vinny's mm -hmm. a drug addict. Yeah. Oh and, yeah. The constant, the social the mom is the one who kicks Bruce out of the house. Yep. Mm -hmm. Like you get all mm -hmm. that stuff. And and when they're and Bruce is like, I don't want him playing speed chess. And the mom's like, Well, tough, because he likes it. That's him. Yeah. That's her defending her champion, very Game of Thronesian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I have something off that line of just like that that conversation in the kitchen. It's that line when she he's like, Bruce goes, that just makes my job harder when he plays speed chess. And she's like, So your job's harder. Like that's mm -hmm. 
sucks to suck dude do your job we're paying you like mm -hmm. and yeah the and the the heartbreaking moment when bruce is way too hard on him and it's kind of throwing the particip the the certificates in his face and she just is like get out of my house like yeah. immediately is just like no like this ain't it and again it's like for all the talk for all the little j j uh kind of mentions of oh the drug addict all drug at drug money at the park it's all this kind of shots at like vinny's homeless he's poor this social looking down on vinny stuff vinny doesn't do anything that disrespectful he doesn't know like he, ever he, ever he, yeah. he, he he would never do something to hurt josh's feelings like that and so it, it is interesting it's fa it's fascinating adam uh, yeah, just to play off that whole sentiment of like, I think that's why this movie does is really good or it is so effective at treating Josh like a child and all the adults are still like intelligent adults. They're not it's this didn't devolve into, you know, like, oh, we're going to, you know, the way of like, oh, we're going to get divorced or there's, you know, marital problems that get thrown in on top of it. Like, oh, you know, to add an extra element, it's just everyone is intelligent looking out, trying to look out what they think is best for Josh and just what ideas, what philosophies are you know create good people create good competitors create people especially who have this kind of ability it's just almost a superhuman ability to do something that nobody else can do um mm -hmm. i thought that that's all balanced really well and i think that's why this movie works a, a lot uh the observations and musings that i wrote down uh in, in line with that were just uh, all of the, the dialogue between all the adults um the fights that the uh, parents have a couple times um the uh the dialogue back and forth. We've already mentioned some of those uh, quotes uh, from those fights and mm -hmm. just the, you know, which who's doing what um, the side characters, I think, as, as you mentioned, Nate, nail it. William H. Macy is in the, the movie, like three scenes tops or just even give us just like a quick, I think he, it's he, he gets, he gets like one scene yeah. of him being like, like looking over oh, me. That, like, Ugh, that I hate you. So funny too. When he yeah. a tuna fish sandwich and he just kind of gives him the, Neh. yeah, he's like, he's got a cigarette hanging out his mouth. He's like, yeah. Ugh. You, you loser um but even that because like when it when that happened i was like why is william h macy in this movie uh the tony shalhoub bit and then um when i first saw ben kingsley i was like how old is ben kingsley he always looks somewhere between like 42 and like 75 and Kinda i can like never Morgan like freeman just ageless somehow and always good and just always like has a presence about like his characters and it, it I, just exudes that he had a decent head of hair though in this. Yeah. I, I, he wasn't, you know, he still had that going for him, but yes, he's always, his presence is wise old mentor beyond his years. He's, he's a yep. hundred years of knowledge, no matter what ages he's in, he's got a hundred years of knowledge packed in that. Head. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just say the like, credit to, to the director for striking a good balance with all of those characters. Cause we do, we do see a couple of them recurring, uh, but mm -hmm. it's very small. Like there's a ton of parents, obviously, that we could have chosen uh, to follow and and do that stuff with. And I and I'm glad that we didn't. I'm glad there was a good balance. Um, and the last thing I'll say is the scene where he where the where the ref for this whole tournament is talking or what you think is to the kids, but it's to the yeah. parents, is such right. like the ethos of this entire movie that. that that's it's a lot too actually and, yeah. and, it, and it flips the script because you expect it to be against the kids and like even if you're like oh well, what if it's not and then it, and then it is the parents and they all you know b break out in in anger and whatever and you're just like oh like it, it just really distills and, the meaning of the movie to you and just slaps you in the face with it and goes like it's it's just a game but it's also not just you know you I mean? bring like, it up so you bring it up just maybe realize that kind of ties into maybe what i was saying too where it's like it's right at the beginning of the movie it's almost like a message to the audience from the beginning like yeah. like hey everybody like you know just like you might you i don't know if you came here expecting a cutthroat chess movie it's actually going to be about having a good heart and being a good person yeah <laughs> like, like, I, I, I ties into what you what you said like your observation is like it's the changing of that guard from the 80s mentality to the 90s mentality they hit you over the head with it and go yeah this is what we're doing now it's like we're gonna let the kids play. play we're gonna yeah. let the kids play now we're not yeah yeah, yeah very nice yeah. nice very interesting that reminded me adam um, how great and accurate was that one guy when they lock the parents in the basement who like won't shut up? <laughs> like we've all been in scenarios where like somebody's being a dick and they ruin it for everybody, and then they feel the need to just keep talking. Yeah, and I just be like, I'm a man of many signals. I, 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 my I, ear, I touch my nose, I touch my knee. You don't know what yeah, I'm doing. They're kicking and him like, out. And he's, like, up. he's like, No, I'm not giving it up. I'm, and like nobody else is talking and the, everybody just wants this guy to shut the fuck up. 
Mm-hmm. And he mm-hmm. won't. It's so funny. They're dragging him out of the tournament because he's like behind his child. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, they accuse him. He's like, I, I always touch my nose. Come on. Like, well, and the kid you're in New York. The like, messenger not, nobody's kid. Listening to you. The messenger kid who has to give them the updates on the game and just the <laughs> way that too. is. And then yeah, he comes, it's over. I'm like, well, who won? And he yeah. doesn't even tell it. Like <laughs> Yeah. Oh, uh, good stuff. Yeah, really, really solid. All right, Adam. Hit us with all oh, the tidbits. And tidbits. Yeah, I almost forgot. Good. There are kind of, kind of a, a lot. Um uh so I guess we'll start with this is a, a recurring theme. Um this uh Zalian works has worked with a lot of the people in this movie in different projects. It it'd be you know, um two people from this or of the people in this movie, like two of them were in one of his other ones. I think it's like civil uh I'm forgetting the name of it. And I can't find it on my sheet. It's obedience. Uh, Thank you. Disobedience. And then like three, three people were in a different movie. And then of those five people, like two of them were in a different movie together. So they all are kind of tertiary related. Um, and one of the ones I found that was interesting was Joe Mantegna and uh, Joan Allen, the uh, parents in this movie, have played husband and wife in this movie, uh, Joyride, Shelter Skelter, and Private Channel. So I think that's why they're, uh, <laughs> they have so much chemistry. I mean, some of those are, those are all, I think, 87. Yeah, um, interesting. So they've done a they've done a couple different things together. Um, a lot of those people. Um, there's a couple different uh, cameos in here. So Josh's first opponent in the national championships, the ranked 82nd overall player, is played by uh, Josh Waitskin's real life sister Katya, oh. which I think is fun. Um, uh, da, 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 da. The, in the second half of the movie, when Josh's father brings him back to the park to play with Vinny, a uh, real life Josh Waitskin and Vinny, both much older, obviously, than their characters, uh, are are visible in the background. The real weight skin is sitting across from uh, the dad uh, and next to Max Pomerank, the uh, the kid who plays Josh. So he's right next to him in that scene when they're playing Vinny. Which one? Uh, when his dad brings him back to the park. Oh, to play yeah, with like Vinny. when it's back to like, hey, we're all kind of happy yep. on the same page. We're on board and all that stuff. Yeah, That's the real cool. Josh he has right there. And cool. then uh, near the beginning of the movie, when Josh's mom picks him up from school, uh, she's talking to a brown-haired woman. That's Josh Waitskin's mom. Oh. Uh, <laughs> awesome. uh, many of the characters who fi- who played famous chess players were actually played by themselves. Cameron Shirazi, Joel Benjamin, and Roman. I do not know how to pronounce this game because it's D-Z-I-N. Oh, it was, real, it was really those people, oh, okay. except for the guy, uh, Aza Hoffman. Uh-huh. Uh, he's because the guy who's like neurotic and is like at the end, like he's holding his hair back because he's staring at a, a chess. Yeah, he's the guy played by Andrew answer. Pendleton. Yeah, Andrew Pendleton. So that's that's a, that's an actor, but everybody else was the same uh, people. What's up, Doc? And my cousin Vinny fame. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's the he's the super nervous lawyer. Yep. Um, Lawrence Fishburne's role was originally uh offered to Ice T. That I knew. Which I think would have been super weird. Like I don't think. I, think, I mean, I think it would have worked, but it's better this way for sure. It's yeah. not like it would have tanked the movie or anything. Yeah, it's just it just would have been very very different. Yeah. Um. So we talked about uh, Ben Kingsley's portrayal of Bruce Pandolfini. Uh, he was actually a principal technical advisor on the Netflix miniseries The, the Queen's Gambit. So when you said this, this may have, you know, helped out boost yep. or, or that may have helped boost uh, some repeated viewings of this mm-hmm. movie makes sense. Um, and then uh, when I read out the, 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 what this movie's about, it says the famous, but unlikable Bobby Fisher. I didn't really know anything about Bobby Fisher besides the chess stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, apparently he's a vocal anti-Semite. Oh yeah. And and denounced the movie. He's a conspiracy theorist. He What's said that, that they, uh, it was a Jewish conspiracy to sully his name and make money off of him at the same time. What so, was that line from um, that Charlie Kaufman movie that we watched? The little oh, like four year old author. Was it a virulent oh. anti-Semite? Yeah. yeah little <laughs> winky. Yeah. The, yeah. The, the Pulitzer prize winning uh, book or whatever written by mm-hmm. a five year old. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. Little Winky is a vir- is a virulent anti semite. <laughs> um, some crazy stuff. So that's fun about uh, Bobby Fisher, which you know I didn't yeah. know. And then the last thing I have is that the chess piece that Josh finds in the park at the beginning of the movie appears to be a replica of a knight from the the Isle of Lewis chess men set, which is one of the earliest piece chess pieces found in Europe, um, dating oh. back to the 12th century. And Harry and Ron play with similar pieces in the first Harry Potter and Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, which is super fucking cool to me. So 
I think that's neat. I always thought that piece was so cool. Camera. I was just like, yeah. what kind of chess set is that? Mm -hmm. really century, baby. <laughs> the way he finds it in the dirt, like it's Jumanji. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> An ancient, like, oh, he found the piece. Now he's bestowed with the magical chess power. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is kind of how it feels. <laughs> ancient relic. Drums in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Lawrence Fishburne says, choose. <laughs> Who's your baseball. character? <laughs> yeah, Chester. Red baseball. pill or the blue pill? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that too. Um, all right. Is it time? It's time. Oh, it's time. Let's do it. The moment we've all been waiting for. Hit me. Ba -ba! Oh, yes. Beautiful. Oh, can gorgeous. you picture Josh in that coat? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. <laughs> And maybe <laughs> drowning in that coat because all of his fashion is so floppy and 90s already he yeah. just flop around in that thing yeah. <laughs> it's waddle with the arms all yeah. right <laughs> it's time for us to award the mccabe mccabe coat of excellence mm -hmm. uh we give one out every episode we Kinda can like each give one out if we want. We don't have to give one out. It's just to somebody involved with the movie who we believe exhibited excellence. And mm -hmm. again, I think we're going to run into a spot here with these January movies with child lead performances where are you going to give it to the director or the kid? Mm -hmm. And I, I think, I mean, the movie doesn't work without either of them. Yeah. You need yeah. a performance that good from the kid just like Ivan's childhood and just like where's the friend's house mm -hmm. to make this movie work. But there are so many other things around it and about this movie and the fact that Zalian also wrote it and directed it. I'm giving yeah. it to Zalian for this mm -hmm. with, mm -hmm. you know, he can loan it to, um, to Max Pomerink. Pomerink whenever he wants. Yeah. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm going to I'm going to zig here when I've been zagging. I've been giving it to the director most of the time or splitting it. I'm giving this whole coat to Max Pomerank. We're flipping here cuz I've yeah, been giving it to the kids. Mm -hmm. I'm giving <laughs> this one to the kid. I just uh this time, like I said, it's the it's the understated just the facial yeah. expressions and it's him holding his own with all these established, you know, really uh, you know, incredible actors. I mean, that is kind of the one thing that's kind of the difference between these other movies we've watched this month is it's like the kid is the focus and in paper moon, there were some recognizable names for sure, but in Ivan's childhood and in where's the friend's house, you know, we didn't really know any of the other adult actors and they certainly and weren't that the focus could of be it. due to the fact that they're foreign movies for sure, for sure. Older, and it, so we're well, not going to know who they are, but it, but this is the only one where we get it, where we kind of have like our, our main star going toe to toe with big actors who we know and have seen in a lot of things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I just think every time he holds it, he just nails it. He just nails like shy, quiet, but gifted seven year old or, or eight year old or whatever. Like he just nails that. And uh, so I'm giving it to Max. And uh, I am going to split it down the middle. Yes. I, unfortunately, I just you can't have this movie without Zalian and like the vision. He wrote it. He wrote a bunch of other really good movies. Mm -hmm. Um and you you don't like to your credit or to, to your point, Dylan, uh, you don't have another kid that can do this to go up toe to toe against these, these great actors or these mm -hmm. actors that we recognize and know a lot about. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing that I was going to say is the, is a tidbit I didn't mention because we were running long and stuff. Uh, Max Pomerank, Pomerank was chosen because he is in real life, a chess player or was at the time of the movie. So the producers wanted somebody who would be at ease correctly playing chess mm -hmm. uh, and nobody else could. So he was chosen because he could. So that also nice. helps. That's, chess that's an actor. Win. That's actor credit right there, right? Like, yep. Also, this should have been in tidbits, but I forgot about it. But I need to include it now because this two is extra a movie tidbits, folks. I two watched a lot of with my tidbits. with my dad, and it's one of his favorite movies of all time. In 1995, Max Pomerank was in a movie called Fluke, which there's a dog wearing human shoes on the cover, and mm. it doesn't have very good reviews, so I'm not entirely <laughs> sure what it's about. In that movie. He plays a character named Brian Johnson. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> so there you have it. Uh, fantastic. Well, it sounds like it sounds like your dad is getting a let Josh cook shirt. Yeah, for sure. Off. He needs and one. A, and a, and got at least one customer. <laughs> yeah, at least one. And a 4K version of Fluke. So. Mm. <laughs> um, all right. Cl closing statements. Closing statements. Um, this is one of my formative movies, like one of the movies that made me 
Mm-hmm. You can kind of put it that way too. Uh, one of my favorite movies ever made. And is I, this is just the highest recommendation I can possibly give a movie. It's closer to being my favorite movie ever than it is like my 30th favorite movie ever. If that kind of tells okay. you like sort of the tier that like my top 18 to 20 movies are in. Yeah. Yeah. For me, okay. it's yeah, it's one of the best. If, if, if we did a tournament of all your favorite movies, it'd be it'd be a movie that no one would want to play. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> that really hard six C that just oh, she's <laughs> fighting through everything. <laughs> Um, uh, mine is, uh, yeah, I'm going to keep mine pretty quick. It just, this is a wonderful time capsule of the nineties and a coming of age movie, uh, and a movie with a really great timeless message about competition and about raising kids. Uh, and it's just wonderful and, uh, it gets a little better every time I rewatch it. Uh, and yeah, I'm glad that we could wrap up our month, uh, that are themed with these movies about kids with this one, one of the definitive ones, in my opinion, that just nails it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, mine's short as well. Uh, this is much more than most sports movies ever hope to be. Mm, well Love said. It. Yeah, seriously. All right. Excellent. Well, this is a lot of fun. This is a good month. Uh, reminder, next month, uh, February, starting it off with In the Mood for Love. We will hopefully uh, get that out to you as soon as possible. And uh, whose turn is it to put a wrap on the show? It would be mine. All right. Take it away. He didn't teach you how to win. He taught you how not to lose. That's nothing to be proud of.